Good afternoon, everybody. One of the most popular questions that I was asked when I told people I was moderating this panel is why am I not on this panel? And the truth is that we could fill this building and many more with the number of incredible Africans that there are out there. And uh, young Africans, the youngest continent in the world, are p the people of this continent are pushing the envelope in many different sectors, in the creative uh, sector, film, art, fashion, music, and also in other sectors, tech, fintech, enterprise, industry, so many, uh, um, so many sectors are seeing the, the impact and feeling the impact of young Africans who just simply cannot afford to wait for opportunities to be given to them. And this is at the center of the work that I do at CNN is chronicling and celebrating the work of these young people who are really pushing the envelope. And so thrilled to be moderating this panel of incredible Africans. But first, we will um, watch a short video of some incredible Africans uh, presented by one of our sponsors, the MasterCard Foundation. <coughs> As a citizen of this city, we believe that our action to make it cleaner would be to recycle at least one type of waste. A waste tire doesn't decompose unless you burn it. So this is how we come up with the idea of making research about tire recycling, and this is how everything started. Quand un pneu arrive chez Ecover, il est recyclé à 100%. On va dire presque pour le nylon. Tout est totalement recyclé. Chez nous, c'est du zéro déchet. D'ailleurs, notre devise, c'est rien ne se perd, tout se transforme. Every time I see a tire on the city, I'm just like, hmm, I'm coming for you. My name is uh, Millicent Adoboy. Deputy CEO of Achieve Our Force Limited. Achieve Our Force Limited is on a mission to save lives through organically grown um, turkey berry fruits um, that we process and add value to them into teas, juices, cereal mix powders, and jam spreads. The motivation and the passion to see that people eat healthy diets, eat healthy foods, the fact that we are creating jobs improving the livelihoods of people and contributing to food security and especially a shared African prosperity. That is really what keeps me moving. My name is Obano Chukuizam Riomachi. I'm the co-founder of Prep Class. We're an edtech company located in Lagos, Nigeria. So Prep Class connects learners and tutors across the country. The model that Prep Class works on is something that became much more important during the pandemic. Learning through the online platform, connecting learners to tutors from anywhere, you can learn from anywhere at any time, became much more important during the pandemic. And I think that's one of the, one of the benefits of having a company like this that merges technology and education. As long as we're able to impact lives, both on the tutor side and on the learner side, we believe this product is something that could be a um, game changing across the entire continent. So I will just start with a very quick introduction of our panelists. So on the far right, we have Arish Noor, who is a writer, producer, political analyst, and entrepreneur at, uh, uh, an, an entrepreneur at M MSNBC. She produced Up with Stephen Konaki, a roundtable <coughs> discussion news program. And prior to that, she did a stint with Al Jazeera English. Uh, welcome, Arij. Thank, Thank you. you. It's great to be here. And next to Arij, we have 
Chido Cleopatra Mpemba, who is a, a youth envoy at the African Union Commission and where she uh, is one of the youngest diplomats in uh, the AU. So um, she was appointed as the second African Union youth, youth envoy uh, in November 2021. And um, before that, she has worked as a banker at Standard Chartered Bank. So huge welcome, uh, round of applause for Chido. And last but not least, we have Denise Longhom Mante. <laughs> Uh, she currently serves as a special advisor at, in the Bureau of African Affairs at the US Department of State. And in that role, she's responsible for implementing President Biden's US Africa's uh, uh, Leaders Summit uh, commitments. And um, she also served as a director of Southern African Trade and Investment at the White House. Huge. So thank you, ladies, for being here, all-star panel, panel of ladies. And um, so tell me, incredible Africans, um, we'll start with an African figure that you uh, admire, past or present, uh, and, and, and tell us why <coughs> you admire them. I'll start with you, Arij. Wow, me? Um, I admire the filmmakers that I work with at Statement. First and foremost, I think this generation of auteurs and directors, writers of film is possibly the most inspiring and credible that we've seen from the continent. Uh, this is what we spend our time working on at Statement. And I, I find them endlessly inspiring. So I would say our filmmakers. Fantastic. What about you, Chido? Well, I would say that I admire our political leaders, especially the young women that are being resilient despite the challenges that we're faced with on our continent and despite how difficult it is for young people to get the space, but they take it upon themselves to just lead and take that ownership and shape their policies. If I give a concrete example, when you look at countries such as Namibia, Namibia is the youngest minister. And not only that, Namibia is the youngest member of parliament. And we see that gradually increasing, for instance, in Sierra Leone, they just appointed a young minister of ICT. And that really inspires me because in such a space where we've seen that it's been constantly taken up through various political leaders and on a generational landscape that are you know, mostly older, it's really inspiring to see young people actually taking the lead and breaking the status quo. Okay, thank you. Denise? Thank you, Stephanie. I think um, I would say I'd, I'd admire our young leaders truly in the creative industry space. I think that the currency of our generation is really Africa's innovation. And I think the creative industry sector is a booming sector. I think Africa's culture, African agency, African talent, and African creativity is what is truly leading the charge. And I think it's essential that we um, allow young leaders in this space to truly take ownership to help us address, I think, the pressing world challenges. Um, one, one of the, the themes from our Africa Leaders Summit at the um, President Biden reiterated is that it's, it's important for us to focus on what we're doing not only in Africa, but with Africa. And so as we empower our young leaders, specifically in the creative industry space, as they share their own stories, take ownership of, of those stories and innovate those stories into uh, addressing our, our world problems, I think that's going to be a huge, huge benchmark for the future. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. So Chido, let me come to you. You work with the African Union. Yes. And you know, a lot of people kind of say, what, what, what relevance does the African Union have to me? Not many people engage positively or uh, uh, indeed very much with, with the African Union. How can that change? And, and your role as a youth envoy, mm. what, um, what can you do to kind of foster that engagement? Okay, I think maybe I'll start off about talking about my journey as the African Union Youth Envoy. When I got into office, I decided to embark on a listening tour. And the purpose of that listening tour is because I realized not many young people actually know about the African Union. Mm. Not many young people know that they're included within the African Union. Not only that, but if I'm gonna go to the AU head of states meetings, for example, where I'm lobbying for these young people, it has to be centered from young people themselves and how they want to be represented. So you find that through this tour across Africa, and even in the diaspora, we actually did one on the sidelines of the US-Africa Summit in Washington, DC. 
you find that through those opportunities, through using a three-way model, a youth town specifically, where young people also get to contribute their solutions towards the Africa that we want in Agenda 2063. The second part of the model is through community engagements because I always say that we should not forget the underprivileged. Mm -hmm. We have so many young people in underprivileged communities but are also creative and finding ways to survive and make a living innovatively too. And finally, the policy and political advocacy is important because we need to address you know, policies that are friendly towards young people. But having said that, it's important as well that they have access to the information. What does it mean to be part of the African Union? And I think it's very important that we have the African Union as an intergovernmental body to bring about unity, to speak with one voice, and to make sure that we have a bargaining power. Just yesterday, I was part of a panel where we're talking about the participation of young people at the global stage. Because in as much as we still have our challenges in Africa that we're trying to meet, it doesn't mean that young people or young Africans do not deserve to be on the global stage. We want to contribute to yes, on the continent, but we also want to contribute towards global development. And that would take us standing together as Africa. Lastly, the last example is, for instance, the Africa Climate Summit, which was just three weeks ago in Kenya. Again, there was a, 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 you know, an opportunity for Africa to have a common position towards climate change, as well as the challenges that they're faced with collectively as Africa. Right. What about you, Arij? I mean, how much do you know about what the AU does and how much do you engage with it as a filmmaker? Uh, to be honest, I think that there's an opportunity to engage more. I think when you're talking about, I deal specifically with film and television on the continent. And, um, you know, the crisis there is really a crisis of opportunity, funding, access, that type of thing. And I think the people who are going to make a difference today are the people who are going to build the infrastructure and the pipelines that we need mm. to, you know, for us to see outcomes that we want to see in the next 10, 15, 100 years. Uh, certainly there's a policy piece to that work, and I think that there are some great people doing it. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the engagement could and should be more, and, and, and it's going to require sort of everyone working in their lane to, to really be able to, to realize what we know these creative industries, especially, I think, in film and TV and music, to, to kind of get where we're going. Yeah. So let me stay with you. Um, film and TV, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, very important forms of communication. Yes. And many people talk often about changing the narrative of the continent from the bombs and bullets images, the poverty porn and things like that. How important is that in the, in the work that you do uh, in the kind of the films and, and the projects that you work on? Well, I can attest to the fact that we have seen and are seeing so many stories that have nothing to do with that, right? I think it's very clear that the creative talent on the continent is sort of unmatched. Mm -hmm. It's explosive. There's incredible stuff happening in, in all sort of fields across the creative spectrum. Uh, and I think that our filmmakers are taking on different, different themes in their work. It's really not about bullets. It's not about war. Uh, I think some of the most exciting scripts that we've read and projects that we've worked on at Statement, my company, um, so many incredible LGBT stories coming out of the continent right now, coming of age stories, so many diaspora stories that we're seeing, people who want to make films both on the continent and in the West and sort of speak to that experience of living in both places. Uh, so I actually think that our creatives have already exploded all of those kind of limitations and now it's really just about giving them the opportunity to succeed and fail like everyone else has. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Denise? So yeah. the work that you do with the White House and you, you were part of the team that organized the US Africa Leaders Summit. What, um, what kind of trends are you seeing and what, what excites you about the things that you're seeing coming out of the continent as you sure. work? Sure, and I think, um, and I emphasize the creative industry sector because um, I do think that it's a very strategic, significant sector. Um, I think it's how Africa will share its stories for the world to hear, right? And Africa will take ownership of those stories. And so during the summit last year, 
we hosted a number of sessions to focus on that sector in particular, but also how the sector is also um, playing a significant role in innovation on the continent, right? And so whether it's digital, whether it's fintech, creative industries, film, arts, um, you know, music. Uh, music has really taken a huge toll across the, the country. The other day I was saying I was in Macy's and I heard them playing WizKid. And I think that's a pretty big deal um, because people are now beginning to embrace Africa's culture, its diversity, its heritage. But the key thing is that we have to protect the ownership of that, right? right? And so we have to do what we can. And so on the US side, looking at how we can support the regulatory frameworks of Africa's culture, its diversity, and its heritage is something that we are looking into. Um, you know, I was saying the other day as well that before there was, you know, different fintech companies in the US, there was fintech companies in Nairobi, Kenya as well. And they were way far ahead of, you know, mobile payment systems. But the problem is, you know, intellectual property and protecting those rights. And so I think as, as we see the, the sector boom, I think on the policy side, we have to ensure that we're doing what we can to protect those rights, to protect the ownership, and to encourage it. And so what I would say to, I think, our young leaders in the sector is that, you know, um, you have to value what you do. Right. And when you value what you do, um, the world will value who you are. Mm. And so I think it's critically important, you know, the innovation coming from out of the continent the creativity, the ingenuity of the continent is absolutely amazing, right? And so value what you're doing because the world sees. Um, the creative industry sector has not gone unnoticed by US companies, of right? Um, people are noticing the importance of it. And so we want to do what we can to protect the ownership of that and also amplify the importance of that sector. Yeah, that's very important. So how do you prevent, you know, you say people are noticing, how do you prevent exploitation, for example. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important. So regulatory frameworks, right? It's important to match the policy with the creativity. And so working with various governments on the continent, um, you know, the US, we see the, the major US tech companies also on the ground, us working with them to ensure that they're also coordinating with the governments on the ground to protect the um, intellectual property rights, I think is key. Um, you know, at the State Department, we have an entire team that's working on, on some of these things. Um, and so it's something that, you know, as the industry begins to grow, you, you'll begin to see more policy, I think, parameters that will be put in place to support the growth of the industry. But if we don't talk about it, I think, you know, it it can go unnoticed, right? So it's important to use these platforms to talk about the importance of it and ensure that it's on everyone's radar. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk a little about your personal journey. Uh, Chido, okay. tell us about you know, your, your kind of trajectory to becoming the youngest diplomat in, in the AU. That can't have been an easy, easy okay. feat. Tell us, tell us how you um, kind of made it. Sure. I'm going to tell the story, but also with some wisdom, wisdom nuggets. And this also goes out to the young people that are also in the room. So I started off my career as a banker. And when I was in the banking industry, that also came about as an opportunity through networking with my peers. And through networking with my peers, I grew an interest to want to work in the corporate sector and engage the corporate sector and get to learn more in terms of you know, financial, from a base of financial literacy, actually. And whilst I was in the bank, I had a sudden in, uh, you know, interest for development, where I just really wanted to now learn more about sustainable development. But of course, within my space, I was literally in risk and financial risk, and I took it upon myself to actually do a lot of voluntary work. So I did a lot of voluntary work over the things that I was interested in, and I started you know, making sure that I utilize what I've seen over time to have developed as a talent towards contributing to the community. Not only that, I also then got an opportunity to attend various fellowship programs that was also as a way for capacity building. So for instance, I was a Mandela Washington Fellow. Mm -hmm. And you know, through being a Mandela Washington Fellow, I was at Dartmouth College actually, and I got to also now learn more stuff to do with design thinking, get to engage and network with my peers from across Africa that were doing amazing stuff from across the continent. So you know, as I continued with my role in the bank, at some point I decided that, okay, it's actually now time to move. 
and go towards what I had a passion for. Of course, it was a scary journey. You're young, you're women, and here you are thinking, okay, what is next? And straight after taking that decision to leave the bank, we got into COVID-19. And yeah, I am now thinking, oh my goodness, what is gonna come next? But again, I took that opportunity to see what I could do um, you know, during the time when COVID-19, and you know, I worked with our Minister of, of for Youth, um, youth Sports and Arts. And during that time of working with her, we actually created an initiative called the United Artists and Athletes Program in Zimbabwe, because I'm from Zimbabwe. And that program really was a way of trying to empower artists and trying to empower the creative industry because they were affected the most by COVID-19. Of course, we could not have concerts and everyone was locked up at home. And again, um, through that, I also had an interest to actually start working more with young people and across all board because, you know, I gained this experience on the sidelines, being a Mandela Washington Fellow, being a climate reality leader, now being exposed to artists and athletes. And when this opportunity came to become, you know, the, the next special envoy in youth for the African Union, I decided to just go for it and I applied. And this has landed me here. But I want to also emphasize something. And as much as it landed me here, I've also received a lot of support from young people, my fellow peers, and that came through the network I'd created working in the bank, the network I created by becoming a Mandela Washington Fellow, as well as you know, now being exposed to different organizations and institutions, including such as the Mastercard Foundation. So the power of your network really helped to propel you. Yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Arish, can you tell us some of your journey as a filmmaker and some of the projects you may have worked on that uh, the audience may be familiar with. So I began my career uh, working in US foreign policy. My uh, area of specialization was the Middle East and the Horn of Africa specifically. So I worked for the Brookings Institution in Qatar and did a lot of research uh, doing that. Um, as soon as that was over, the Arab Spring happened. My family's been living in Cairo for at this point, almost 20 years, we were there for all of that. Um, and that sort of got me thinking about documentary and moving more into media. Uh, at that point, I had already started work on a television show that I had created and sort of learning by doing in this industry is how I began in my 20s. Uh, by 10 years ago, I was working in news, um, which Stephanie mentioned. I worked at MSNBC for a while and then sort of started writing more cultural writing instead of the political stuff that I had been writing before, analysis. So features in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar about filmmakers in Africa and the Middle East, women always being the theme. All of my work has a gender lens. And then by 2020, we launched Statement Films and the mission was very simple. It was to bridge the gap in the market between African women-led IP, so television and film, and you know, the market. So the late 2010s really was a watershed period when it comes to African cinema on the world stage and at top tier film festivals. And there was, there was a moment sort of at the end, I would say 2018, 2019, when we saw, you know, Genevieve Nagy's Lionheart got picked up at Toronto um, for money that and no one had seen up until that point for an African acquisition. The following year, Maddie Diop's film won the second highest award at Cannes. And so African women filmmakers were really, really leading the charge. And so Statement Films was really dedicated to taking that to the next level and really supporting our women filmmakers. Since then, we've expanded and it's now a media company with a production arm. And the media side of our business now is really about covering the African entertainment industry because there's no well, people like to say that there are trade publications that follow the industry, but not really. So, <laughs> we, uh, so we launched that over the summer and Statement Films became Statement and then our production arm is still Statement Films. And we, in terms of project, Stephanie, I mean, we are, you know, we are very lucky to be in business with incredible women filmmakers from the continent. Uh, we have a really special project that's in pre-production. I can't really say much about it, but next year, look out for it. Um, and we have incredible partners on that. And what is it about? <laughs> <laughs> you can give us a hint. I tried it. I can't, but I promise. I promise it's worth the wait. It's, okay. It's the greatest script anyone who's ever had access to the script has ever read. I'll tell you that. Awesome. Um, and so we're really excited. And 
yeah, that's what we do. That's the journey. Okay, thank you for sharing. Yeah. So my, my story is a bit, it's a bit different and interesting. Um, I started my career almost 15 years ago as an intern um, from the state. My parents are from Ghana, uh, immigrants from Ghana, um, and I was born and raised in the Bronx, Bronx, New York, uh, not too far from here. There are not too many diplomats from the Bronx, New York, um, <laughs> but um, you know, I was born and raised there all my life, and um, you know, when I went to college in upstate New York, um, I realized that you know, I wanted to get involved in foreign policy and foreign affairs, um, you know, but both my parents were immigrants from Ghana. Um, highest level of education was probably primary school, right? And so um, there was no one in my family who was involved in foreign policy or foreign affairs, but it was an interest that I had. And I think um, it's truly important to have mentors. And mentors, you know, in my career, uh, in my field, I think has been a true value add to, to my career. Um, you know, internships, mentorships yeah. has been a huge factor in how I've been able to navigate um, this space in my career over the past 15 years. And so, you know, I, I always tell our, our young leaders, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, if you have a dream and a goal, it's, it's certainly possible. And I think that's definitely um, a story that I can share with everyone. Absolutely. A diplomat from the Bronx. That's, uh, that's fully inspiring. Yeah, so let's talk about young people on the continent. A lot is said about the advantage of yeah. having the youngest continent and, and uh, the youngest, the large number of young people. Mm -hmm. And many talk about the youth bulge mm -hmm. and how the underemployment and unemployment uh, crisis that a lot of African countries face is a disadvantage. I mean, what, what is, I'll come to you first, Chido, you know, in terms of your, uh, role as a kind of policymaker and uh, with ear to policymakers. What, what is your view? What is the African Union's view about the youth bulge, the so-called youth bulge, and how it can be used to Africa's advantage? Okay, so just speak personally on my view. I really think that we need to go down to the root cause. We have quite a lot of young people that are doing amazing things across the continent, but we still have a lot of challenges that come to those young people. For instance, we have a high unemployment rate. And why is that so? If we take it back, it's also centered upon education, where the traditional curriculum is that you go to school, you learn a certain you know, subject, and then you look for a job. But then, again, when you look at that, there are not so many jobs in the market compared to a number of graduates that we have each and every year. So we need to relook that, and we need to reshape that. How do we empower young people to actually be the ones to create employment? How do we empower young people for entrepreneurship? But in as much as we do so, how do we also protect them? This morning, I was at an event which is actually supported um, by Massacre Foundation on the launch of the Youth Friendly Standards. And what is coming up the most is that in as much as young people have all these ideas, often they're exploited. The way they're exploited is number one, access to funding is very, very limited. Mm. We often hear that young people are not bankable you know, to name a few of some of the challenges they're faced with. And we need to look at how can we mitigate that. We need to build the capacities of young people. And if they come as a risk to get access to funding through their startups and, you know, all the various initiatives they have, then we need to look at ways that we can mitigate the risk, but not necessarily in a way that will disadvantage the young people themselves. Because where we're going, we have so much young people, but then not all of them are really fully reaching their potential because of the environment and the lack of opportunities that's across the continent for them to grow. Now, putting it back within my role, which is uh, pretty much created so that I could advocate and lobby for young people at the decision-making table. But when I joined the African Union, as much as I got in and I was doing all the advocacy, I realized that I also had to be strategic, I also had to learn and understand how it works and how it functions. If I give you a concrete example, just earlier this year, we had our first ever African Union Youth Town Hall meeting, uh, you know, which was attended by the president of Burundi, who has now officially been named the youth champion for the African Union after our lobbying and the chairperson. And during the Town Hall meeting, I made a call to action for ministers of youth to meet because our ministers of youth for Africa had not met in four years. Yet that is the body where we can actually pass decisions for young people. Mm -hmm. So for instance, within the African Union with various departments and through those dif various departments and the commissioners, we also have what we call the specialized technical committees. And these specialized technical committees, STCs, are the committees where all the various ministers meet 
and we also then get to present, um, you know, decisions for, for their, you know, decisions for them to consider and, you know, to make, you know, policy requests on behalf of the African Union as a whole, but so that they can execute across their member states. So, you know, with that, uh, you know, call to action, they finally met this year in June after the four years, and it gave us an opportunity now to present requests on behalf of young people and what young people need. And specifically within my role, we also have what we call the African Union Youth Charter. The African Union Youth Charter was a decision that came from our head of state in Bunjal in 2006, 2006, where they made a decision that you know, they will use that as their framework to shape their national youth policies. But now if you think about it now, that was 13 years ago. And as much as this document, but how is it according to the current realities that young people are faced with? So one of the things we lobbied for was, let's go back and revisit, revisit the youth charter. Let us have added mechanisms so that we can also look at what's currently happening with young people today. Secondly, we also need to have a review of monitoring mechanism. And as much as we have member states that sign onto different charters, for instance, this year being the theme is Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, we have 47 countries that have signed on. But now when you look at the African Union Youth Charter, we have 42 countries that have signed on, but how do we review and monitor how it's actually being executed and implemented across our member states? Because of time, I think I'll end here, but yeah, the various ways we can look at. Okay, thank you for sharing that. We are running out of time, and I want to get some audience questions in. You spoke about the open national youth policies. Most of those policies have been written a long time ago. Okay. We are asking now for open access, especially for Africans in the diaspora. How do you get even your world leaders or African leaders on the social media platform that they've created to even reach out to them to seek for collaborations? Even if you reach out to those offices with emails, they're always spending for a long time. So one of the reasons for the even the Can I SDG have a question, goals, please? I would like to make that comment so that I can get to the question I quickly. don't have time for yes. comments. I'm really sorry. Okay. Get to so the question. So my question is yes. this. How do we walk for Africans in the diaspora to have this open collaboration, same with the US African Leaders Summit, where people are proposing to have that open access. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, and then we have to end this panel. Any other questions? There's a question there. Hello, my name is Dolly Kolabalogun. I am the founder and creative director of Retro Africa Gallery, and I also work as a technical advisor to the Minister of Art, Creative Economy, and Culture in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is one of the leading drivers of cultural exports uh, on the African continent. Um, and we have a new ministry that's now focused on creative economy. However, as you've mentioned, there's a lack of, of, of policy frameworks which we're working on, but also a lack of investment from, the, from external partners to drive the creators locally. My question is, how can, I, how can we work together to get more strategic funding and um, liaison uh, collaborations back on ground in Africa, specifically in Nigeria, to drive the film sector, the music sector, the visual arts sector, the gaming sector, uh, for a future Africa that we're, that we're trying to build. Okay, thank you. Do you wanna take? So I'm gonna take the creative industry okay. uh, question. Oh. So I think, you know, as we talk about the youth unemployment on the continent, there's also a boom in the startup culture on the continent, right? And if we were to support the startup culture, particularly in the creative industry space, I think that we could, perhaps balance the match of the youth unemployment, right? And so access to global finance, I think, is a key one. Um, I would encourage that you know, all of the um, governments on the continent create certain platforms and pipelines for us to liaise with, with the governments, right? So if it's a ministry specifically focused on the creative industries, it makes it easier for us to coordinate. Right, coordinate ex uh, you know, specifically with specific ministries, uh, certain people that's within government. As we talk about access to financing, I, th I think it's important. And if we're able to support the startup culture, I think that would truly help the youth unemployment as well. Okay. Did Can I also just weigh yeah. in on this one? I think with your question, something that came to mind for me was first of all, the Nigerian you know film industry is in is the I think is admired widely, not just on the continent, for how incredibly self-sufficient and innovative it is. And I'm really excited for the next 10 years. I think continent-wide, though, the issue, um, to speak to the point of financing specifically, mm -hmm. is that our continent is still stuck in this old way of getting films financed. So 
It's this soft financing model that's prevailed for decades that's left most of African cinema IP European owned, where European you know, ministries of this or that um, have financing and they'll sort of donate, Africans will make their films, they, the films tend to not have the best production value, they tend to have the same producers attached, people who have been benefiting from the system for years and years and years. So, when people like us come in to actually create an industry, that's what we're up against. So I think there needs to be a shift in mindset, and I think that people need to start getting honest about what it's going to take to get to the next place. Okay. Thank you. So do you want to take the question okay, briefly? Thank you. Thank you. Arisha, I'll, I'll take this briefly and we can take it further offline. But if I think I understood you clearly, you mentioned about how do you people within the diaspora also get access to the opportunities at the African Union. So I'll give a concrete example of the US Africa Summit. We actually had a convening prior to the US Africa Summit. I personally held a consultation with young people and friends of the youth of the diaspora at our US um, Washington DC office of the African Union. We also have a report specifically where we took that report to the decision-making table and said, as young people, as you deliberate for the US Africa Summit, this is what we want, and this is how we also want to be represented. And I we also must leave it there, okay. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. thank you so very much for listening. <laughs>